So let's bow in. Welcome everyone to the Path of Awakening course. And uh, we have been working our way through Trolig Rinpoche's book, Mind at Ease. Um, <clears throat> tonight, we are going to be discussing the first part of three of chapter nine, which I think maybe you might find some of you, I certainly have, to be one of the most profound teachings one could encounter. And not easy. So, um, we are talking about ground, Mahamudra, and the two practices of Mahamudra Shamatha, which he calls tranquility meditation, translates into English, and we've already done, done that, and uh, insight meditation, which translates Mahamudra insight meditation, which translates Vipassana which also means superior seeing. It can be translated a lot of ways. I don't remember anyhow. And tonight we're on, we're beginning the chapter on insight meditation. First part of three. I want to stress going into this, that this is all about awareness. Awareness now, in the present moment of anything and everything, and especially awareness of one's own mind, of what arises in the mind. This awareness is not conceptual, although it may be awareness of concepts, of thoughts, conceptual thoughts which arise. But the understanding of this awareness is just pure, awake, aware, like a flashlight, like a beam of light, illuminating whatever it may be that is arising now. That is what this teaching is about. He starts out by saying that insight meditation does involve thinking, employs thoughts as part of the practice. Now, with tranquility meditation, we learn that the main Three main purposes, according to Morgan Chowan, are one of which is emphasized here. Uh, the three main purposes of shamatha, tranquility meditation, are the first one begins to get an introduction to how, how much we think, how often we are lost in thoughts, dreaming and don't even realize it, until we come back and say, oh, I was lost in a dream, just like watching a TV show. Second benefit is that you get a rest, a rest from your dreams, because dreams are full of anxiety of one kind or another. And the third benefit is that we begin to develop the muscle, which we all have, everybody, of realizing that we are dreaming and coming back. Coming back to what? To this, to now. When we're dreaming, we're thinking, oh, yesterday that person said this to me, and I said that to them, and blah, blah, blah. And then we realize, well, I'm sitting here now, and we come back. These are the three benefits of tranquility meditation, one of which in particular is most important, and that has to do with getting a rest, because we are pacifying the turmoil of our confused neurotic minds with tranquility meditation. The pain and the unhappiness and the confusion. And this is really the main function of shamatha, of tranquility meditation. Now, to this end, we come back from thoughts into pure awareness of something, an object of one kind or another. And there are many, many objects that one can come back to. One object is the breath, 
That's one of the most common ones. Even here and now can be made into an object. We come back to this here and now. And in coming back to this, we come back from thoughts with, with all their Sturm und Drang, to use a German expression, storm and thunder. We come back to the peace of this and get a rest. With insight meditation, he starts out by saying that it involves thinking. It employs thoughts as part of the practice. How so? We've just spent all this time uh, working on tranquility meditation, and it's taught so many places. I mean, John Kabat-Zinn teaches uh, basically what amounts to tranquility meditation, and it helps people uh, endure hospital stays, um, raucous or uh, tumultuous business situations, all kinds of things, because it helps one endure, get through um, emotional turmoil. But now he's saying insight meditation does involve thinking. It's like it's going against that. How? It employs thoughts as part of the practice. Now, this is actually many insight meditations, I'll just he's repeating what I just said, offered in the West are actually about tranquility meditation, not Vipassana. Their aim is to quiet the mind. But gaining spiritual insight meaning heading towards enlightenment, <clears throat> overcoming delusory states of mind and attaining enlightenment are possibly only through the analytical practices of insight meditation. Analytical practices. Now, what does this mean, analytical practices? It doesn't mean thinking about things, like analyzing them. If this causes that, then that has to result, and then that will cause something else. That's one kind of analysis. That is not the analysis that is meant here. The analysis that is meant here is that we are seeing very, very clearly what is arising in our minds, the thoughts. And we're understanding in a deeper way what these thoughts actually are. In a superficial way, we just follow the thoughts. We follow their content. One thought says, well, if I do this, then that will happen. And if, I, if that happens, then the other will happen and so forth. And I'll get a result that I like, don't like, whatever, maybe. That's one kind of analysis. That is not what is being referred to here. This kind of analysis is simply seeing what that thought, where it comes from, how it endures, when it goes and where it goes if possible, what its content um, signifies of anything. So he says, gaining spiritual insight, overcoming delusory states of mind, and attaining enlightenment are possibly only through the analytical pr practices of insight meditation. And I stress that what is these analytical processes depend upon is simple, clear awareness of one's mind in this present moment. Now he talks about the problem. The problem traditionally in Buddhist doctrine is described as the two veils of Varana. Varana means veil which prevent us from seeing things as they are. And so we only see what things seem to be. The first veil is called the klesha of arana, the veil of conflicting emotions. As long as one believes in an I, an I is constantly at risk. One's happiness, one's welfare, one's unhappiness are constantly at play. And the five emotions, desire, anger, jealousy, pride, and ignorance, are all arising. I'm jealous of so-and-so because he, she has what I want. I'm angry with so-and-so because they didn't behave the way that I wanted them to. In fact, they behave the way that I don't want them to, and so forth. This is the first veil. It's called the klesha of arana, the veil of conflicting emotions. They're conflicting because things are not as we would like them to be. They're in conflict with that. 
The second veil is called the Janiya of Arna, the veil of knowledge, or he translates it conceptual distortions. Janiya means is one of the words of knowingness. And what this has to do with is believing in I and other in the true existence of me and the true existence of that. They call it, he calls this conceptual distortions. These distortions keep us in the world of samsara and prevent us from achieving enlightenment because we are not seeing the world as it truly is. We're seeing it through the veil of these conceptual distortions of I and other and all the judgments that we affix to those. I, I'm smart, I'm handsome, I'm beautiful, I'm wonderful, I have a few faults, but and on and on. And the other, oh, the other, that other is pretty good, this other is pretty bad. And we just live in this world of constant I other judgment. And, and when we do that, we want to pull the things we like towards us, push away the things we don't like, and remain the same distance from things that we're indifferent to, which are the three poisons. So these two veils, the veil of belief in a self and the conflicting emotions that arise and make us so unhappy. And then the veil of conceptual um, distortions or mistakes. And what he says is, and this is doctrine, their contention on each other, these two veils, they both depend on belief in I and other. And he says, conceptual distortions primarily manifest as our dualistic notions of subject and object, our primitive belief in the substantial reality of contingently arisen empirical phenomena, that things that arise actually exist. They arise and they show up and we say, well, that exists. There's a car there. There's a tree over there. There's a person here. So insight meditation is important in Buddhist practice because it allows us to deal with conceptual distortions. After tranquility meditation has calmed the intensity of conflicting emotions, we have to calm down first, come back from our anxious, stressed out unhappiness or happiness, which is always fleeting and we know it as it happens. And we come back to pure awareness in insight meditation, which allows us to see these thoughts as they arise, endure, and pass away. Then he just points out that when the text talks about defilements and delusions, <clears throat> that refers to the veil of conflicting emotions, that's defilements. And delusions is the veil of conceptual distortions, believing in I and other. So the veil of conflicting emotions is emotional turmoil about this and that, I and other. And the veil of conceptual distortions is false beliefs about what reality actually is, that things actually exist, endure over time, when in fact they don't. This is we're living in a constant and ever-changing presentation. These two veils, he says, produce the primary mental disturbances. <clears throat> this again, we get the Buddhist you know, number schemes here, um, which are ignorance, shamelessness, recklessness, restlessness, greed, distorted views, conceit, hatred, and envy. How about that? <laughs> That's what these two veils produce. <clears throat> oh, and also, I forgot, avarice, covetousness, covetousness, worry, sloth, torpor, and skeptical doubt. You can find these in the text. And if you want to contemplate them, you can do that. There are 14 of these. Worry, sloth, torpor, skeptical doubt, conceit, hatred, envy, and so forth. So he says, as Buddhist practitioners, we shouldn't be content with the mental calm, equipoise, of a calm state of mind, we need to recognize that one, the mind has no enduring essence. It's constantly changing. 
not even for an instant does the mind or its contents stay the same. It's a constant shifting presentation. And that contrary to our deep-seated belief, there is no psychic substance, that's me, I, the soul, such as an enduring self or soul. That's another myth that we tell ourselves, that is told, but which can't be found. It's just this constant change. Impermanence is the foundation of every, everything in the Buddhist teachings. There is nothing that endures. So he says, the thinking, as it were, that characterizes insight meditation, vipassana, is not the usual discursive kind of conceptual proliferation. If this happens, then that happens. I'm going to figure out my neurosis. I'm going to figure out who I am, actually. It's not that. But a type of thinking that is designed to cut through to the very heart of things, to pave the way for a direct insight into the very nature of ultimate reality itself, he says. And this really isn't a kind of thinking. It's about thought. But it's awareness of thought. It's simply seeing it as it arises, endures for however, just not even a nanosecond, and passes these thoughts. He calls it a kind of epistemological inquiry. I mean, I, I think this must be his editors. Um, epistemology is the um, this is it's a word for the Western uh, philosophical inquiry into how do we know. That's the question that epistemological uh, philosophy asks. How and what do we know? So he's saying that this is a kind of epistemological inquiry. Well, you could call it that, but it's not really an inquiry. An inquiry is saying, well, what's the question and what's the answer? And in this, it's simply the practice of awareness is the way we inquire. It's not really actually asking a question. It's bringing simple it's actually dropping questions, dropping any kind of notion of purpose, and simply seeing our minds, what arises in our minds, as it is, as it does, as it arises and passes away. We sit here and we just watch. And there isn't even an eye who's watching. There's just this constant arising and passing of thoughts. He says it's not about our individual history or psychology. So we're not trying to figure out why, you know, um, I I'm, have an aversion to angry women. <laughs> My mother was very angry all the time. So it, that, that kind of inquiry is not this. This contains maybe the thoughts that would be in that kind of inquiry, but it's not the purpose. We're not trying to figure out why um, I like this and don't like that, why I'm afraid of A and not afraid of B, whereas somebody else is afraid of B and not afraid of A. That's not it. That's the realm of psychology. This is deep, it's beyond philosophy, inquiry, you might say, or examination into the very nature of the reality that we live. He says, we're not trying to figure out our psychic life. He says, because the causes are present in the very strategies we employ to make sense of our neuroses, of our psychological neuroses. The insight technique, what we're doing here, is designed to dismantle our fixation on these thoughts and emotions to dismantle our fixation on these thoughts and emotions, our desire to figure them out and to solve some kind of problem. We're not solving a problem. We're just becoming aware of what is. He says, because it is our fixation that reinforces our biases and prejudices and dulls the lenses through which we, and then he used to use a phrase from the Bible, through which we see through a glass darkly means we're confused. 
Buddhism doesn't say that psychological insight into our lives is unhelpful. And it doesn't deny that insight meditation might produce some useful snippets, he says, <laughs> of understanding about our personal problems. But this is not the aim of insight meditation at all. It's much deeper, much more fundamental to our very state of being. Because this agenda, the psychological agenda, is only temporal and partial as it addresses the human condition. He says, in fact, trying to see the whys and wherefores of our thoughts and emotions during insight meditation is the very thing that we're trying to undermine. Trying to see the whys and wherefores of our thoughts and emotions during is, is the very thing we're trying to undermine during insight meditation because it is these discursive thoughts that reinforce confusion about our true condition. We're moving into a very different understanding of who we are and what this world is with insight meditation. We're moving into that place, Rinpoche said, we're falling through centerless space. He says, the bad news is we're falling through centerless space. The good news is there is no ground. This is what insight meditation is taking us into. The centerless space of no purpose, no understanding, no goal, no beginning, no end. Just this. This, which is the ultimate real here and now. He says, we have to understand the nature of our discursive thoughts themselves. The nature it means to really see them, how, how, <laughs> how just transparent and temporary and fleeting they are, whatever they may be. I don't understand this. There's a good one. It just comes and goes. And meanwhile, here we sit. This is the nature of all thoughts. They come and they go. I do understand this. And that comes and goes. And we see that. And we begin to understand that thought is just a bunch of stories we tell ourselves. And then they're gone. Those stories and the thoughts that embody them. He said, it is about recognizing that thoughts have no enduring essence whatsoever. Whatsoever. Not at all. When we're having this thought, we think it's so important. Oh, I got to do this and I got to do that. Maybe I'll make a memo to myself, blah, blah, blah. And then it's gone. And a few days later, we've lost the memo. It's gone into the space. He says, we have to understand the nature of discursive thoughts themselves, and that they are mere fictions, partial truths, and so not really true at all, like the stories we see in movies or read in books. We can have two different kinds of insight. One concerns the causes of things, and the other the nature of things. The second kind of insight is the one conveyed through insight meditation, the nature the nature of things, the nature of everything that arises, including and especially our thoughts. That's why thoughts are so important. You can't shut them off. It's part of what it means to be a human being, is to have thoughts. But we can come to a very, very different understanding of what they are. And in doing that, we come to a very, very different understanding of who we are. They go together. And then what the world is. It's a different kind of world and a different kind of me. He says the Mahamudra teachings counsel that we cannot understand the nature of reality without understanding the nature of mind. And this understanding is the whole purpose of insight meditation and mind produces thoughts. 
We can't stop that. It may stop of itself from time to time, from moment to moment. But that's not the purpose, the goal of meditation. The goal is to rest in awareness. That is the whole purpose. Awareness of anything and everything, and especially of what's going on in this so-called, so-called mind. He says, so what the, and then again, using, you know, big words, he says, so what the Mahamudra teachings offer is more akin to a phenomenological description of the mind within the context of meditative experiences. That's again, a reference to Western psychology. Phenomenology basically describes how things are put together, what the parts are, the phenomena, phenomenology, how they come together and come apart, what constitutes them. And he's saying that really this meditation practice is a phenomenological description or phenomenological exploration. It focuses on the essential structure of experience of mind itself. And it's so different than the way we think as we come to this. We're thinking, gee, I want to understand this. Bring that to awareness. Gee, you know, I don't think I'm confused. I'm, I, don't, I don't get it. That's another one. All those thoughts are just meant to be seen as they arise, endure for no time at all, and pass away. He says, the fact that mind is empty of essence and that its emptiness pervades all of our mental events. Mind, meaning it's happening right now. We're all looking at our screens, listening to these words, thinking, do I understand this? Do I not understand this? Then he makes this distinction between empirical mind, which is really thinking mind, and the nature of mind, he calls it sim, it's called simni in Tibetan, um, yeshe, deluded in wisdom mind. Basically, this is the difference between, you know, as Suzuki Roshi in Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, Soto Zen, calls it little mind, thinking mind, and big mind, which is just here, awareness. He says, the Mahamudra approach undermines this dualistic emphasis between these two kinds of mind from the very beginning. It doesn't tell us to reject our thoughts and emotions as delusory and to strive for some other transcendental state. Rather, we are encouraged to recognize the nature of mind within the nature of thoughts and emotions themselves. So what we're being told to do is to simply be aware of all the thoughts and emotions as they come and go. It's a little dizzying, I think you might find, because we're giving up a point of view. We're giving up purpose. We're giving up an ax to grind. We're giving up a problem with a solution approach. And instead, it's just like turning on a flashlight of awareness, of seeing it. That's all. Just seeing it purposelessly. You could say, well, there's a purpose in it. If I'm just seeing it, I'm bringing it to awareness. That isn't a purpose. It has no future ramifications. If A, then B. If I get this, then I'll do that. It's not there. It's just light, awareness, seeing the thoughts, seeing what goes on in our minds. He says, this will at some point lead to a direct realization of the nature of mind, which really means a direct realization of the nature of reality, this that we experience. He says, during this process, however, we have to appreciate that our experiences will be affected 
and informed by our own predilections and personality. So our realization of mind will be realized by each of us in a uniquely personal way, both in terms of when our realization dawns, when, and the actual nature of our insights in meditative experience, how we put it. It will be in contrast to an answer or response to our neurosis in a way. And yet, the instruction is the same for all of us on how to do this, to bring awareness to it, to what is going on here in our thoughts, in our emotions, in our mental events, to just see them as they come and they go, and they come and they go so fast. He says the main thrust of this practice, insight meditation, looking at our thoughts this way with awareness, is how elusive thoughts are, how insubstantial thoughts are, how ephemeral, short-lived, just boom, they're gone, and how intangible our thoughts are. Nothing in themselves. Those words, elusive, insubstantial, ephemeral, intangible, that constitutes our mind, but we're not thinking like that. We're thinking about, gee, what am I going to have for lunch? Gee, you know, I've got to take care of this big problem. That's what we're, we're lost in the dreams, in the content. But the main thrust of the insight meditation is to see that these very thoughts that we get lost in are elusive, hard to find, they're just gone in a minute, insubstantial, hard to find, they're just gone, <laughs> ephemeral, short-lived, to say the least, and intangible. Can't hold them in your hand. They're nothing in themselves. We resist this truth by placing great value on our thinking, on our thoughts. We're so lost in them. And then he says, through this practice, this meditation, we'll come to realize that everything that occurs in the mind is of the nature of emptiness. See, this is what emptiness means. That everything that happens is insubstantial, constantly changing, ephemeral, as soon as it appears, it's, it's dying or it's leaving, and intangible. You can't grasp it. You can't hold it. This is what emptiness really refers to. And we're living in a very different world than we thought we were. We thought we were. When we think about where we're living, we're living in a world of things, trees, houses, people, cars, whatever it may be. This is a world of constantly changing presentation of phenomena. He says, this means that everything we experience, everything, has no abiding or fixed nature and therefore has no real substance to it. We're at sea. We're at sea. We're lost in the middle of a huge <laughs> cosmic ocean. <laughs> he says regarding thoughts, in the Mahamudra tradition, they are not regarded as a handicap or impediment to practice. They should not be discarded or even dismissed because in, don't we have this tendency? Oh, I'm thinking again, I'm a bad meditator. You know, hmm, I had some time there when I wasn't thinking. That was, that was a good meditation, we think. And he's saying quite the reverse. They should not be discarded, these thoughts, or even dismissed, but rather put to constructive use as a necessary tool for the generation of insight. Without disturbing thoughts and conflicting emotions, there would be no path and no insight. We're seeing them in a, just a very new and different way. We're seeing them as they are, as they arise, endure, we can even call it that, and disappear.
he, then he quotes, I'm going to skip a little bit, he quotes Gampopa. Gampopa lived in the 11th century, um, was the first head of the Kagyu sect. He was a student of um, Milarepa. He says, a meditator should not think of discarding thoughts, but instead should think of how wonderful it is to have these disturbing thoughts, how beneficial and indispensable these thoughts are to meditation. Without these disturbing thoughts, how would we recognize the nature of mind? And this is true as long as we understand what the practice really is. It's not to be involved in these thoughts and figure out whatever they're telling us to figure out. It's to see them with awareness, 100% awareness. And then he goes on, or the text goes on, so we should not think of discursive thoughts as a huge obstacle to meditation. In fact, as we become more acquainted with our thoughts, though it may seem absurd to think that we can get closer to our thoughts than we already are, <laughs> We will be able to perceive the thoughts themselves as expressions of our true nature, our true nature, which we're not in touch with as we come to the path. What we're in touch with as we come to the path is a story about me and my project and my past and my future, my goals, this story that we're telling ourselves. But when thoughts are expression of our true nature, we're seeing them without that story, or maybe we're seeing that story, but we're seeing them as they are, as they arise and pass away. He says, in the Mahamudra literature, this is known as the dexterous play of the, of the mind. And this refers really to the fourth stanza, I think it's the fourth, of the lineage chant, which we just did, which says, and I'm just going to read it the way we read it. He changes the wording a little bit here, just slightly. The nature of thoughts is dharmakaya, reality. That's it. As they arise and pass away, they're expressing the real, not in their content. They could be telling you that red is green and, you know, <laughs> sweet is sour. But in their fact, in their presence, the nature of thoughts is reality, is dharmakaya, because they're actually appearing. Nothing whatsoever, but everything arises from it. Everything. All thoughts and events. To the meditator who sees the, he calls it dexterous, unobstructed play of the mind, grant your blessing, so that I realize the inseparability of samsara and nirvana, meaning they're just thoughts, samsara and nirvana, they're just stories. He, in, in the text that he gives it, he says, so that I, the identity of nirvana and samsara is realized, that they're the same thing. It's all this. And then <clears throat> he talks about the exercises in this chapter, that they're going to help us to get to know our discursive thoughts better, and we're going to try them not, not. We'll do one tonight, I think. He says, through this familiarity, we come to understand their nature of thoughts and consequently gain insight into our own true nature. We have been thinking our true nature is embodied in a story that we can tell ourselves, a philosophy, a religion. And what he's saying is it's an experience in the moment, now, always here. This is what our true nature really is. He says, the things that obscure thoughts have the capacity, the inherent capacity, to reveal as well. This fact is not appreciated by the dualistic mind that's always looking for answers and rewards. In which it, he says, the dualistic mind, which is trained into thinking that everything is one thing or another. It is, by the it is by recognizing the nature of discursive thoughts and the nature of the mind that is, it is by recognizing that 
the nature of discursive thoughts and the nature of the mind are indistinguishable, that we can prevail over the seemingly intractable obscurations of our minds. It is by recognizing that the nature of discursive thoughts and mind are indistinguishable. The nature, not the content of the thoughts, the way they arise and pass away. Like milk and butter, they are distinct, slightly different, like milk and butter, but, but fundamentally the same in nature. He says, but their nature is the same, unlike milk and sand. In the same way, mind and thoughts have the same nature, the nature of emptiness. There's no substance to it. It's a constantly changing presentation that you can't grasp, but just if you try to grab it, it's already gone. This is the reality that we're living in and that we're being enjoined to understand and become one with, to really, to really live in it. Yampopa again, he says, if at this moment one wishes to achieve liberation from the cycle of existence, samsara, one must recognize ordinary mind, for it is the root of all things. This ordinary mind, which is just clear awareness in which in which thoughts arise and pass away from time to time in the present moment. And then it goes on, that which is designated as ordinary mind. And this, by the way, is, if for those of you who know this phrase in Tibetan, is tamal geshepa, ordinary mind. This which is designated as ordinary mind is one's own awareness right here, right now as Dan is always saying to us, right here, right now. Left in its natural state, this awareness remains unstained by any non-ordinary perceptive forms, unmuddled by any levels of existential consciousness and unclouded by dullness, depression, or thought. It's this simple, clear, here you are, awareness, you're looking at the screen, you're hearing these words for better or for worse, <laughs> that clarity, that's the ordinary mind. So in essence, Buddhas and sentient beings are the same. He says, it is only owing to our delusion that we have failed to realize our nature. We're lost in thoughts, in stories, television shows, movies, novels, philosophies too, Western philosophies. While Buddhas have succeeded in realizing their nature, so we remain in delusion, believing our thoughts, while Buddhas are blissfully free of that same delusion. And then Rangjung Dorje in his prayer of Mahamudra says, when it is not realized, one circles in the ocean of samsara. In thoughts, purposeful, cause and effect, getting something. It's not about that. Pure awareness has no cause and effect. It has no goal of getting anything. It's just awake to whatever happens is happening. Then he talks about three aspects of mind. Nolo, um, which is essence, nature, rangjin, and the characteristic, yi. The essence is empty. The nature is innately awake and luminous. Vipassana insight meditation gives us the profound realization that none of our mental states and processes has the power to corrupt, influence the fundamental purity of the mind or to compromise it in any way. This is the moa, the essence, the emptiness. So nothing that we think can really change or compromise the, the fundamental essence of mind. And then the essence is emptiness. The mind's not an entity or a substance of any kind. It's not a thing like a table. 
And finally, the nature. We cannot locate the mind anywhere or identify it as being anything because it is insubstantial. You're just constantly moving, going. It is endowed with rich and diverse cognitive capacities. This is why the Mahamudra teachings say that the nature of mind is luminosity, the luminous presentation of all this phenomena, including thoughts. This luminosity of mind is the dual function of illuminating and purifying the conflicting emotions. Mind defiled, he quotes the Samputa, which is a text that I'm unfamiliar with, but here's the quote. Mind defiled by passion and other uncontrolled impulses. Defiled by passion and other in, uncontrolled impulses is indeed the mind of cyclic existence, samsara. So when mind is defiled by passion, aggression, jealousy, all that, it's the mind of samsara. Discovering the mind's intrinsic lucidity, the awareness, is liberation indeed. We're liberated from all these shoulds and shouldn'ts thoughts. Undefiled by lust and emotional impurities, unclouded by any dualistic perceptions, this superior mind is indeed the supreme nirvana. And then the Uttara Tantra said, says, and I'll skip, skip the first part, it's just like it's hidden, you know, like um, gold buried beneath the floorboards and <laughs> a Buddha in rags and a prince in the womb of a common woman. Thus the nature of enlightenment remains hidden in all sentient beings who are overcome by transitory defilements who are lost in the stories of their thoughts. And then the characteristic, which simply says that thoughts, emotions, memories, and feelings, these are the display of the mind, both diluted and undiluted. Both diluted and undiluted mind display thoughts, emotions, and all the rest. So he says, <clears throat> All three of these aspects have the same nature, emptiness, meaning you can't grasp it. It's gone as soon as you try and hold it, like water running through your fingers. This very thought, all thoughts, has the nature of all pervasive ultimate reality. And that nature is what we just described, insubstantial, transitory, vivid, and go on. He says, we need to maintain this uniquely Mahamudra view, free from dualistic thinking. Dualistic thinking says, if I do this, then I'm going to get that. That's just going to cloud it over. So when we practice, we're just practicing pure awareness of everything, including our thoughts, just seeing them and letting them go without purpose. What a tremendous rest we could get from that. What tremendous freedom. In fact, as this, he's going to teach, we could get absolute joy from this. The joy of being free from the compulsion of having to solve things, make them better, fix them. He says the Mahamudra practitioner must resist this kind of binary conceptualization self-improvement. As Padma Drupa, Drupa, the great Kagyu master said, disturbing thoughts are the cause of awareness. So you should focus your mind with a sense of joy on these very thoughts themselves, awareness. If you try to eradicate your thoughts, they will become even more prolific. And don't we know that to be true? If, on the other hand, you realize that they do not have any enduring essence, then there's no need to abandon them. You realize that these thoughts have no enduring essence. They're already disappearing as you become aware of them. 
And so there's no need to abandon them. You can't abandon them. They're already gone. And if you try to see yourself in a state of abandonment with no thoughts, that's a big thought. So just simply come back to this clear, effortless awareness. So we no longer need to regard thoughts as the enemy. We no longer need to feel overwhelmed by our emotions, trepidations, sinful thoughts, and so on. This capacity, this awareness that we attain through this meditation has the capacity to expose the true nature of our discursive thoughts and immediately dispel our illusions. We see discursive thoughts, all these thoughts, all thoughts for what they are, passionate attachment to unreal and non-substantial things, to imaginary things. He says, Mahamudra meditation is designed to produce bliss, luminosity, and mental equilibrium because we've given up all purposefulness and spaciousness toward our discursive thoughts. And I wrote in my, in my this is my voice, OMG. Thus, the meditative state is characterized by these three attributes of bliss, luminosity, and mental spaciousness. And let's just do the first of a series of meditations. Um, we'll do some more next week. Maybe Michael will be here and help with this. So if everyone would take a good posture. We're supposed to start, by the way, by contemplating the four preliminaries, joyful to have such a human birth, etc., difficult to find, free and well favored, death is real, comes without warning. We've already done that. And the four immeasurables, may all beings enjoy happiness and the fruit of happiness be free from suffering and the fruit of suffering and so forth. We've done that. And then we're supposed to, when you do one of these contemplations, rest for a little while in shamatha. So let's just do that for a second. Put our attention on our breath. And now as discursive thoughts arise and pass away, Regard them as waves on the surface of the ocean of your mind, and that they're unable to subvert your mental stability. They're just waves on the surface of the ocean of your mind. So we sit here, we're watching the breath go out, dissolve, thoughts come, they go, and they're just waves on the surface. You don't pursue these thoughts. When they arise, you're just aware, they come and they go, like waves. Stop there. He says, you will come to discover perhaps gradually, gradually, that the mind is not an entity that is substantial and solid. It is hard to grasp this elusive ephemerality 
changing quality of mind. But it is exactly this difficulty where I'm trying to engage in experience. So let's just do it again. Take a good posture. Come back to Shamatha. This open, tranquil mind. You can use the breath if you wish. You can just rest in this space. You can use whatever you like as the object that stills the mind. And we just sit here and watch whatever shows up in our mind, in our experience, our sensory experience. Sights and sounds, these were words. Doesn't matter. Thoughts, emotions, feelings. Maybe you feel uneasy or dissatisfied with this. Just see that. And it passes like everything else. And we rest here, watching whatever shows up. He says, like a child gazing at a fresco on the wall of a monastery. That's what we're like, without agenda, without complications. Just look. So I think we'll stop there. <laughs> Except you can keep this up for the rest of your life. And we can have a discussion. There we go. Michael. My internet connection is really poor, so I don't know if people can hear me. We can hear you. Okay, good. Um, just a couple of things. I think one thing that he says really early on is that um, we, our thoughts are nothing in themselves. It's worth reflecting that this is a truth that we intuitively resist recognizing. And I think we're often aware of the elusive and empty nature of thoughts in retrospect. If we think back to uh, who we were, or what we were doing a year ago, we might not even remember. And yet it was. Oops. Sorry, Michael. See that in the moment, which is why the shamatha piece. Michael, you're cutting in and out. I'll save it for next week. <laughs> good, good, yeah, please, because we, we're, we're losing you. Friend. Yeah, I had uh, a similar a comment on that same line from Michael, but probably a bit of a different take of it. It, you know, and I was just kind of wondering what the, uh, resistance is to recognizing that you know is, is this the addiction to our stories our neurosis you know and, and there's uh trail like uh Rinpoche doesn't talk nearly as much about neurosis as uh Chogyam Trumpa does and I'm, I'm wondering if that's where our addiction to our own habits comes in 
I think so. Yeah. We get addicted to our stories. And more than that, it's as though we're so immersed in the mode of storytelling to ourselves, so habituated, we don't know anything different. And really what this is, a doorway, this is a doorway into a different understanding of the world, a different experience of the world. This is a doorway into emptiness, shunyata, reality. I mean, it's very radical being asked to give up the beliefs in our thoughts and to live a very different way in the immediate moment. Yeah, you could see it like how the neurotic mind would be like, oh, no, that's too good. Or the neurotic mind could be saying, oh, no, I'll forget to pay the bills. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. You're worrying all kinds of things in the neurotic mind, but then you're back in the neurotic mind. <laughs> oh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, that gets you that quick. It does. Meg. Along those same lines, I just um, thought with therapy, um, a person can do years and years and years of therapy, and some people get addicted to it. It's like getting addicted to your own neuroses, I guess. And um, at some point, if it's just the self-obsession needs to be put aside and you can jump to something else. And I, I think Buddhism is a, a great jumping off point. It doesn't have to be that, but uh, uh, but it's a good it's a good model of emptiness. Yes. I think, too, that therapy is very involved with stories, stories about me and how I've been damaged and what their effect is and how I can undo it. And all these stories they are full of concepts and emotions. Whereas this is not about stories. Yeah. It's about pure awareness of the mind and thought and seeing it, seeing it come and go, and not getting caught up in the story. So it's a very different modality. And as Charlie Reputation basically says, in one way or another, much more profound. I mean, therapy is trying to maximize the benefit of the stories. You know, trying to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, make the stories better, you know, come out with good ends. Yeah, and I, but I, I do think there's a, a purpose to that. It's just um, you can do that for a while. And then then when you're done telling the stories, rather than going back and starting at the beginning and telling all the stories again, then, you know, it's, it's time to move on into an, another model of self-healing, I guess. Good. Miriam has a hand up, I think. Okay, Miriam. Yes, I, I just wanted to share my experience with um, the difficulty in letting go of the stories. I mean, somewhere we're convinced that they have some truth and that there's something intelligent in the thinking process. As long as we believe that, we'll keep going uh, in that realm. But the letting go into shunyata or the ego death, in my experience, was scary in that it's like letting go of everything you know. And so we were, I, felt, I felt so attached to my identity because it's all I know, right? And letting go of that seemed... Like it would mean letting go of everything that is familiar to me and jumping into nothingness, basically. Um, but what I'm coming to realize is that it's not quite that. It's it's becoming even more intimate with experience. It's not jumping into a void. It's becoming very intimate with the immediate experience. And this is where the intelligence is. 
not in the story or the thoughts, but in that immediate moment. So, so it doesn't, when I, when I, when I see it this way, it's not as intimidating, but ego death is not easy. Letting go of everything you know about yourself or you thought you knew. I, I think we're profoundly attached to that. So that's why I anyway. think I think that's why we're enjoined not to reject ego, which could be another story, but simply to become aware of what is going on in our minds, in our experience now. Because we're so lost in dreams all the time. And just the emphasis again and again is on awareness. And in this case, awareness of our own thoughts. That's what he's stressing here. That insight meditation uses thoughts and emotions as objects of awareness. Usually, you know, if you're angry with somebody, you hardly even know it. You just, you know, you're so caught up in it. Right? This is asking us to actually see everything. Awareness is the key. And we can practice it on the cushion. For starters, yeah. ease into it. You know? mm -hmm. I don't think it's not, to me, it's, it's, it's very, very different way of knowing and being. Yeah. You agree? Yeah. It's more impersonal in a way, but intimate yeah. with what's happening. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very intimate and direct and immediate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we all have to experiment with us. That's great, Mary. Thank you. Mary. No, thank you. <laughs> I can jump in here. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Miriam, for that. And um, thanks a lot, Meg, for, for bringing that up. And I, it, it's really a, a brilliant point, you know, and uh, what Miriam said, you know, bolsters that, you know, I think, uh, John, I don't know if the word you were looking for was, uh, you know, more adaptive stories, you know, it's, you know, more socialization. And, but, but anyway, it's, um, I mean, that's true. That is what you're, you're trained to do as a psychotherapist. That's what I was trained to do as a psychotherapist. And I referred to this last time, but, you know, I'm having, I, you know, with a couple of different things, but especially this, I'm, I, I, I'm having this somewhat unique and wonderful experience of doing something now that I haven't done in three years. And there are a couple of personal things like that, but, but going back into it. But, and one of those things is, is going back into private practice and letting go of my, uh, any institutional um, affiliation that I have. And my, my, so I have the way I practiced you know, private practice for 25 years. And then I have this, this gap because of personal reasons, because of COVID and, and when I've, so, and so I've been with all, with you all and studying with you all and meditating with you all during this period. And so just in the last month, really going head first back into, you know, full or part-time practice, it doesn't matter. Um, but working with a population that is coming to me, you know, for help. And I'm working totally differently. I'm working totally differently in terms of asking people to just stick with the feeling. Just tell me the feeling. 
where it is, you know, what it feels like. And, and the impulse is always to go into a story, you know, about the feeling either that, you know, because I have these feelings, I'm a bad person or, or just even just a more, you know, interpersonal story, you know, and it's, I'm feeling good about it. And I think the people I'm working with are feeling really good about it and finding it to be a change from what they're used to. A lot of people have been in therapy before, you know, take, take a break or switch therapists or whatever. And it's, um, at first it made me a little nervous, but, and, and because of what, what Miriam was saying too, it's, because when I'm doing that together with somebody collaboratively, it's I'm open right there too with the person, you know, and I don't, I don't, I'm not hiding behind a story or a role or a label or a doctor, you know, title. Um, and it's, uh, it's great. It's really great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thanks, John. That was just a great exposition of what we're doing and uh, the chapter. And so, thank you and thank everybody. Thank you. I see Trip. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, a good string of conversations. Miriam, I'm glad you raised that. And then Dan, with your follow-up, and what's going through my head, um, I read a quote that I, I pulled out of the Crazy Wisdom movie that I read to the group a couple of years ago. Uh, and if it's okay, just two seconds just to read it because it's relevant to what I want to say. Mitchell uh, Levy said uh, that uh, Trungpa Rinpoche said to him, I'm completely who I am and I want to help you understand how to be completely who you are. Just study the Dharma, which is the truth of trusting who you are, discovering your own goodness, discovering your natural wisdom, and discovering the importance of being compassionate. And every time I read it, it still resonates with me. And I was thinking, you know, especially what you said, Miriam, and, and Dan too, because Dan, you and I have had conversations. There is an exciting element of starting to see things, even if it's brief and fleeting, more clearly. It's like, maybe for the first time starting to even pay attention to who I am and to be able to distinguish. Uh, it's just a very different way of looking. It's, it, it's almost like a rebirth in the sense of, I think in my 57 years, I don't know if I've ever sat and um, started to know and experience who I am. And it's hard to describe, but there's kind of a, an opening. There's, there's a, a new chapter element um, in a way that I, I kind of never imagined. Um, I think the, sure, it's, it's, it's uh, letting go and taking a big leap, but it's also the beginning of a new adventure is kind of how it feels to me as a, as a being on this earth. Yeah. Well said. Thank you. Yeah. And I think we're all being invited on a great adventure. Anybody else? And save it for the discussion group, Judy. I'm so glad that we're not rushing through this um, chapter because uh, it is 
really so chock full. And um, it's uh, it's exciting. Um, I don't know why this should be uh, so much easier to absorb than um, than the uh, Trump of the passion or for me anyway. Um, but it is uh, so approachable and acceptable the way he puts things. Um, I'm fascinated by that and I'm, I'm thrilled that we're uh, going apace <laughs> um, because I dare to think that I'm getting it. <laughs> Really good. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Wonderful presentation. No, that's just a thumbs up to echo what Judy said. Oh, I see. Again, thank you, everyone, for uh, your wonderful comments. But and uh, John yeah. particularly. Yeah. Truly. Yeah. Wonderful comments. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. It's terrific to be turning this path together. What a gift for all of us. Well, shall we say the closing chants? Sure. Okay, I'll put them up big and I'll mute all. We'll close with a prayer for peace and then we'll dedicate the merit earned by our practice for the benefit of all sentient beings. So, Meg, unmute yourself, Meg. Unmute yourself, Meg. Okay. Thank you. By the blessings of enlightened and compassionate ones, by the power of my positive actions of three times and my prayers of pure aspiration, may wars, conflicts, epidemics, and all other maladies dissolve in this world. And may the earth and all who live on this earth enjoy the abundance of well-being may all learn to live lovingly with each other. By this merit, may all obtain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. From the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. By the confidence of the golden sun of the great east, may the lotus garden of the victim's wisdom bloom. May the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled. May all beings enjoy profound, brilliant glory. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Thanks, Thank John. You, Thanks, Thanks, John. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 John, Good night, everyone. Everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. No, thank you. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Carrie. <laughs> Hi. Good to see you. And I forgot. Good to see you. This is tomorrow. Okay. Uh, Hi, John. Hi. Jackie. Jackie. Hi. It's been, you. It's been a long time, John. <laughs> yes. How are you? Okay, hold on a second. I'm going to turn.